The South Carolina Hall of Fame was founded in Myrtle Beach in 1973 to recognize and honor contemporary and past citizens who have made outstanding contributions to South Carolina's heritage, history, and progress. Bobby Richardson, native of Sumter, South Carolina, played second base for the New York Yankees from 1955 to 1966. He won the Gold Glove Award five times and was selected to the American League All-Star team eight times. The double play combination of Tony Kubek and Bobby Richardson was among the best in baseball. Richardson played in seven World Series, 36 games in all, including a major league record 30 consecutive World Series games. He is the only player from a losing team to win the coveted Sport Magazine World Series Most Valuable Player Award. Robert Clinton Richardson Jr. was born August 19, 1935, the second child of Robert Clinton Richardson Sr. and Willie Owens Richardson. My father was in the tombstone business, marble and granite, and as a little four, five-year-old, six-year-old, I'd go down to his place of business, pick up a granite marble chip, and had a bat and made out of a piece of wood, and I would just envision a baseball game, and I just loved baseball. The very first team I played on was sponsored by the Salvation Army. So as a very young boy, I started out in baseball as a catcher for the Salvation Army, moved into the Knee Pats League, and from there on into high school in American Legion Baseball. In June 1953, Bobby became a New York Yankee. I did sign at 17, the day I graduated from high school. In those days, there was no draft. It was just uh, you could sign with whoever you wanted to. And there were eight teams in the American League, eight in the National League. And out of the 16 teams, I had a chance to sign with 12. No money involved in it. In fact, $4,000 included my first year of salary as well. When I signed, I was given a four-day trip to New York. And I remember as a 17-year-old putting on a uniform and walking through the dugout and out to Yankee Stadium, the wonderful green grass, the expansive stadium. And then I watched the game after I took some batting practice with the Yankees and fielded some ground balls. And I sat on the stand where there were 65,000 people there. My hometown had probably 12,000 at that time. That's something I'll never forget. In 1955, at age 19, Richardson was called up to the majors. As I walked through the dugout this time, not as a 17-year-old, but as a teammate and a player, and actually walked out on the field as a 19-year-old and played in that first game at Yankee Stadium. The thing I remember is I never touched the ball. They didn't hit a ground ball to me at second base. I didn't have a pop-up. I did pass the ball around the infield, and I got a base hit, and I stole second base, and Yogi Berra hit a three-run home We won the game 3-1. to one. By 1957, Richardson was an all-star. Bobby, a Southern Baptist, was a positive influence in the Yankee clubhouse and took some good-natured ribbing from his manager, Casey Stingle. Casey was quoted as saying, Bobby doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't curse, he doesn't chew, but he still can't hit 250. The Yankees lost the 1960 World Series to Pittsburgh in seven games, but Bobby Richardson was the MVP. The Yankees lost the ball game to Pittsburgh when Bill Mazeroski hit that home run out of the park. And we were very down and in our clubhouse. And the editor of Sport Magazine walked in and came over to me and said, you've been named the most valuable player in the World Series. Now, all year long, I only had 26 runs batted in. But in that series, I ended up with 12 RBIs. Six in one game, there was that grand slam. And the funny thing about that is that uh, when I walked up to the plate, I was batting eighth in the lineup, and the bases were loaded. We already scored one run, it was the first inning. Casey Single, our manager, very often that year would pinch hit for me with men on base. He had Enos Slaughter sitting by him with a dugout. It was a great hitter. He would holler out, hold that gun. That meant come on back and let Slaughter hit for you. I listened for that, didn't hear it, walked up to home plate. And then I knew why. Frank Crescetti, our third base coach, gave the signs and I was bunting. Not a good play in baseball. Bases loaded, pitcher up next, one out, the bunt. I fouled it off twice and the count went out to three and two and Frank Crescetti, our third base coach, hollered out, hit the ball to right field, try to stay out of the double play. And the fastball came in here and I hit a line drive to left field. And I guess I was more surprised than anybody went out of the park for a grandstand. Drive to left field and slowly goes back back, back, but he doesn't have a chance. It's a grand slam home run for the littlest Yankee of them all. 
scoring Scowlin, McDougal, and Howard ahead of him. And the New Yorkers lead six to nothing. There was a time in 1962 when I was playing second base and it came down to the ninth inning. The score was the Yankees ahead by one run, but they had two runners on second and third. In fact, it was Matty Alou and Willie Mays on second base. Willie McCovey was batting and he was a power hitter that was probably the uh, best hitter on the, uh, on the giant ball club at that time. I remember that my pitcher, Ralph Terry, looked around and said, man, he's playing out of position. He started to move me, and then he said, no, he's been playing second base. In fact, he's played uh, well over a thousand ball games at second base. Maybe he'll let him play where he wants to play. McCovey hits a sinking liner just one step to Richardson's left. The game is over. The Yankees win and reign as world champs of 1962. Certainly gold gloves are an honor in baseball, and I was privileged to pick up five in a row. Nellie Fox was before me with the White Sox, and he was the perennial gold glove uh, winner at second base. He was traded to Houston, and I picked up five in a row after he retired as gold glove. Then I retired in 1966. They decided since I was retiring and had actually played one extra year that I could have a day at Yankee Stadium. At that time, only 10 had been honored with a day at Yankee Stadium. Every ball player has dreams, and you've honored me today beyond all dreams. It was just a wonderful day in baseball, and I was just grateful for that. And I came back to my home in Sumter, and Paul Dietzel came on board as coach and athletic director at the University of South Carolina. He came over to speak at a bank and asked me if I'd like to be the baseball coach. And I said, Paul, I'm sure I'd enjoy that, but I've got a four-year contract with the Yankees. I just can't do it right now. Well, the Yankees were glad to release me. They paid me off. And then Lee McPhail, the general manager, made this statement. He said, well, when you get settled, just give us a call, and we'll bring the Yankees down to play your ball club. Three years later, we had just lost out to Miami by one run in regional play. So I called Lee McPhail, and I said, I'm ready for the Yankees. He kind of laughed. He said, well, we got a little problem. We're traveling north with the Mets. Would it be all right if the Yankees and Mets come down and play your ball club? And it was a night that just put our team on the map. And not too long after that, we uh, were able to play in the College World Series. And I just felt like that was a big boost to starting our program here at the University of South Carolina. Okay, now see how you're under the ball. Bobby Richardson has spent countless here. hours teaching young people how to play the game he loves. Now catch a, catch a fly ball. And I'm real pleased to meet Extremely you active in Christian today. ministries you throughout his career, Richardson delivered the eulogy at Mickey Mantle's funeral in 1995. I know that he always kept all of us laughing. One of the things that I've realized is baseball has a lot of uh, things that are similar to life, starting out with keep the rules. Certainly in baseball, there are rules that you have to, have to abide by. There's a rule book. The umpire enforces those rules. And in life, it's, it's the Bible. And the Bible has certainly meant a lot in my life. And as a young boy, I realized that these were rules for life and that it was important to have a personal relationship with a living Savior who gives to us an abundant life. And that so many principles in God's Word are good for you as an individual. And certainly uh, we find that that's true in every aspect of our life. <laughs>